Eastly in Nairobi, Kenya, business is booming for traditional religious healers. They cater for Somalis from around the world who want to get closer to their culture and roots. But Africa Eye investigates a form of religious healing gone badly wrong. I have seen clients have broken arms. We have taken some to hospital because of the kind of violence. By going undercover at an Islamic drug rehab center, where the clients are first kidnapped. I see two police officers in a car. I didn't know what they wanted. As soon as I went in the middle, they handcuffed me. And then tortured. <laughs> or a person gets depressed because of the kind of torture he's going through. Cannot talk to anyone. He has no life left in him. You understand? They just can't, can't grab me. They beat me here. I said, nothing I've done. Ask the people. I've done nothing. Eastly, a neighborhood in the Kenyan capital Nairobi, known as Little Mogadishu because it's home to so many Somalis. And it's a global hub for the Islamic healing industry. I'm going to try it out for myself. I've paid this traditional healer a hundred dollars to get rid of my pain. Quranic readings performed by religious sheikhs aim to remove the evil eye or exercise demons, and they are in high demand. In Eastly alone, this new, growing industry is worth an estimated $10 million a year. While these Quranic readers might put a dent in their clients' wallets, that's the worst damage they do. But some of Eastley's religious healers are running rehabilitation centers for the treatment of drug abuse or mental illness. And I've received reports that men and women are held against their will and physically abused in these centers. Some families think the best way to rehabilitate their children is to lock them up. But some of these parents don't know exactly what happens in these rehab centers because these rehab centers are run by religious figures we call sheikhs, and these sheikhs are usually trusted within the community. As a Somali and practicing Muslim, I've come to Nairobi to investigate these rehab centers. It's very difficult to gain access, but one of them did agree to let us film inside. Yeah, the boss. Thank you. Sheikh Hussein founded Mustaqim two years ago. That's a CCTV camera, Bob Wyatt. Through another bolted door is the main complex and yard. Mm -hmm. We get to see that medicine in action, 
The Sheikh and his assistants read the Quran to this young man from overseas. The idea is to push the demons out of his soul. But then the Sheikh refers to a more aggressive form of treatment. As we are packing up, a group of women call out to me. They say that far from taking drugs, their only crime is to have fallen out with their husbands or relatives who have paid for them to be imprisoned here. Nearly all of these women are mothers with children on the outside. Oh. They all said we want to get out of here, but we can't. The longer we are, the more money the rehab people would make. The sheikh walks over and the women fall silent. Ah. Mm -hmm. uh. While these women's claims are deeply worrying, we have heard even worse reports of abuse coming from other rehab centers in Eastleigh. One of those is called Darushifa, and we have found a member of his staff willing to speak out about what happens inside. Ben Injaga works as an addiction counselor at Darushifa. He recounts his first day in the job with horror. I thought it was like torture, a torture chamber. Clients were locked up in rooms. The rooms were dark. There was no ventilation. But despite being appalled by what he saw, Ben decided to keep on working at the center, hoping he could eventually improve conditions for the clients. I made very serious recommendations written down but Ben says the owners ignored him and the abuse continued. So it was a constant fight, a constant fight, a constant fight. He says most of the men locked up in Darushifa aren't even addicted to hard drugs. And they wonder, well, these are people with just a normal mental health issue, mm -hmm. a drug problem, maybe smoking cannabis. And because it's not allowed in the religion, they decided to lock them up and categorize them as dangerous. Ben has also privately reported the center to the police and the Kenyan government's rehab regulator, Nakada. Individuals from Nakada have come to the center and we have explained in detail what happens. And then they go. And reports to the police have been made. Nothing has been done. They just turn a blind eye. Left with no other authority to call on, Ben has agreed to film undercover at the center. You want people to be in your shoes and see yeah, rather and see than it, just... see it. But when I show it to you, then you understand. We equip Ben with a secret camera. Good luck, Ben. We also ask him to record regular video diaries while undercover.
Just as we saw in Mustaqim, a religious teacher at Darushifa also performs Quran readings on his clients. On Ben's first day filming, a new arrival is brought in, Ali. His mother says Ali has been having problems with the school and is into drugs. She is paying the center 500 US dollars a month to turn her son's life around. Ben speaks to Ali to find out more. The center has already conducted a drug test on Ali. No traces of narcotics were found. It's 10 p.m. the same day, and four Darushifa guards are doing their rounds. They are forcing some of the inmates to drink a liquid called harmala. Seconds after drinking, it makes them vomit violently and seems to be used as a form of punishment. After finishing with these men, they turn their attention to Ali. He's prevented from leaving by a guard holding a rubber whip. The guards surround Ali. He has no choice but to drink. Ali gives in and drinks the Hamala and then vomits. A few minutes later, weeping, he pleads for the ordeal to end. Badly shaken, Ali is finally let out by another patient. That night, Ben hands over the day's footage. He's also smuggled out a sample of the Hamala solution so that we can send it for testing. The following morning, I visit a traditional herbalist to find out more. At Darushifa, the staff produce a concentrated solution from Hamala seeds, which have been used as a herbal medicine for thousands of years. They claim it detoxifies drug addicts, but those who drink it suffer hallucinations, terrible chest pains, and severe vomiting. Our lab tests on the center's Hamala solution have revealed that a full cup contains 100 times the recommended dose for an adult, which could be enough to kill.
I have been investigating Islamic rehab centers in Eastleigh, Nairobi. We have gone undercover to expose evidence of systemic physical abuse at one Darushifa. The next day, two guards are once again trying to force Ali to drink Hamala. Like every new arrival at the center, his hair is completely shaved off. One of the security team then picks up a rubber rod and joins in. He himself was also once a patient here, but now has been elevated to a full-time guard. Ali is handed a full cup of Hamala. But Ali appears to have had enough and starts to resist despite the threat of violence. Two of the guards high five each other. Then the beating continues. The guards proceed to beat Ali for five minutes without pause. It turns out two of the men who have been picking on Ali all day aren't actually staff. They are patients. The management gets them to discipline their fellow inmates in return for favors. They can go and sit in the office, they can always go out, ask for things like sodas and they can get them. They have a reputation for being even more vicious than the guards. The clients have already been punished themselves. When they rise to certain positions, they want to inflict the same kind of pain. So for now, we have clients who are sadists and they want to instill fear upon others so that they can rule with an iron fist. One man who knows all about the brutality at Darushifa is Muhammad Ali, an 18-year-old from London. He spent three months inside last year. He says it all began when the police picked him up off the streets. I see two police officers in a car. Didn't know what they wanted. I went inside, they put me in the middle. As soon as I went in the middle, they handcuffed me. Then they drove all the way to Darushifu. Me, as a child, I wasn't in no gangs. I wasn't a troublemaker. Back in London, I was in sixth form. I was applying for college. I actually got accepted, then I came here for two weeks. Then that's what the tragedy happened. You say tragedy? What do you mean? Just because my life has just gone wrong, to be honest. Mohammed found himself subjected to beatings and forced imprisonment. The same treatment our investigation has revealed at the centre. If you do any trouble, if you argue, you have to get beaten up by the watchman, the guard. Most of them are severe beatings, because it's torture, basically. It's... Stuck in Nairobi without a job or money, Mohammed can't return to the UK. So what do you do, just keep quiet? Yeah, just keep quiet. Because here the police is very different, there's nothing you can do. Two policemen are at Darushifa's gate. Ben is there to meet them. Salam, Assalamu alaikum. 
but the police aren't here to investigate allegations of abuse. Instead, they are dropping off a patient. Hassan, a man in his 40s, is brought out of the car in handcuffs and handed over to the security team. His relatives are paying for this to happen. Ben says it's a regular occurrence. So this happens, you come to the center and report that you want a client got him from your house. Yeah, yeah. The center organizes for the police to go and collect the client. So they put him in handcuffs, bring him to the center. So it's a paid service. An hour later, the new arrival is given his first taste of the center's favorite medicine, Hamala. The guards subject the most fragile patients at the center to the same brutality as everyone else. Even the mentally ill, imprisoned at the request of their families, aren't spared. So there is this client who was brought in by his brothers. Uh, the client has a mental disorder. The guy was given harmala in the evening. <laughs> The reaction was very bad for him. And because they locked him up in the room, they vomited in the room, guard came in and was angry at him. Why can't you control yourself? And they beat him up. The guard seems to be toying sadistically with his victim. Whatever the man does, it seems to be a reason to beat him harder. It turns out this particular guard has a strong motivation to be as violent as possible. He's on a trial for his job. If the clients fear him, then He's more likely to get a job trying to increase his salary by being the most atrocious. The incidents of abuse we have documented at Darushifa are all crimes under Kenyan law. Nakada is the Kenyan government regulator with the power to shut down rehabilitation centers engaged in criminal activity. Judith Tawala is its manager of regulatory services. We have heard from people who work in these rehab centers. They have contacted you to give you information what goes on inside and you have done nothing. Um, we also need to be careful when we get information. Sometimes it could be malicious information, but any information we get from anybody in regards to rehabs, we don't take it lightly. I can assure you. We know some of these places have been raided several times. Owners arrested, but not charged. A week later, they reopen. Why isn't Nakada doing enough to stamp out this practice? Maybe our judicial system has maybe issues of more priority than this one, but I think we also have a role as, as an agency when charges are laid to up our game in following up. We wrote to the local police authority to request a response to allegations of corruption and kidnapping made against its officers. There was no response. We also requested an interview with the owner and executive director of Darushifa, Ahmed Smail. He dismissed our allegations as just propaganda. While the authorities may be slow to react to this issue, as a community, we Somalis also need to stop creating the conditions for abuse to occur. It's right and good that we want to preserve our culture and religion, but businessmen who dress up as religious sheikhs 
are rarely the answer to complicated problems like mental health and drug use. Paid to make our loved ones better, they are more likely to make them worse.